Imagine a ripple effect starting millions, literally millions of miles away. A cosmic event powerful enough to, well, to touch almost every aspect of our lives right down here on Earth. I mean, from the satellites guiding your phone, maybe even right now, to perhaps even the, uh, the quality of the air you breathe. The sun holds incredible power over us, and that's precisely what we're preparing to unpack today. Welcome to the deep dive. We're diving into a really significant celestial event, a coronal mass ejection. You might hear it called a CME. It's currently hurtling toward Earth, and the uh, the forecast anticipates its arrival around September 2nd, 2025. Now, you, our listener, you sent us a fantastic stack of sources, really fascinating stuff. Everything from these dramatic solar observation images, they look like something out of a sci-fi movie, honestly, to some pretty dense scientific research papers. And the big question you've asked us, the one that ties it all together, is clear. What could this cosmic phenomenon actually mean for you? So our mission today is to cut through all that noise, all the jargon maybe, and extract the essential insights. We're going to explore the science behind these solar storms. Uh-huh. We'll definitely get into their very real potential to disrupt our technology. That's a big one. And we'll even look into some of the more subtle, maybe indirect ways they might impact human health and, you know, the broader environment. So get ready for some surprising facts, hopefully a deeper understanding of why space weather really matters. Let's jump in. Okay, let's kick things off right at the source of all this um, this energy, our sun. Those images you share showing the CME's path, they are pretty captivating. It looks like a sort of cosmic wave heading right for us. From your perspective, looking at those visuals, what's the most striking thing about this particular CME's journey? What exactly are we seeing happen up there? It's a great question, and yeah, the visuals are stunning. What's truly fascinating, I think, is the sheer scale and the raw power we're observing we're seeing a coronal mass ejection. So basically that's a huge expulsion of plasma, I think superheated, electrically charged gas, and it carries its own magnetic field with it. And it's blasting out from the sun's outer atmosphere, the corona. These images are so valuable because they let us track its journey over hours. You can see it interacting with the solar wind, which is always flowing out from the sun, and other magnetic fields in space. It really paints this complex, dynamic picture of space weather in action. And this particular CME, yeah, it's expected to cause a pretty significant geomagnetic storm when it hits Earth's magnetosphere. That's our planet's magnetic shield, right? Exactly, our protective bubble. And the timing, as you said, looks like around September 2nd, 2025. But, you know, it's critical to understand this isn't some random out-of-the-blue event. It's actually a natural part of the sun cycle. It has this roughly 11-year cycle, and we're heading towards the peak of activity right now. Uh, so more activity is expected anyway around this time. Precisely. So increased solar flares, more CMEs like this one. It's part of the pattern. And NOAA, that's the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. They're the lead agency for space weather forecasting. In the U.S., they've already put out warnings, not just about, you know, potential tech disruptions, which we'll get into, but also about the upside, if you can call it that, potentially spectacular auroras, northern and southern lights. Oh, wow. Yeah, folks in higher latitudes might get quite a show. So it's powerful, potentially disruptive, yes, but it's a known phenomenon within the sun cycle. Okay, so we have this huge wave of solar energy magnetic fields heading our way mm. my mind immediately jumps to well everything we rely on our yeah. connected world when you talk about a geomagnetic storm hitting us what kind of disruptions could we you know the listeners actually experience day to day that's the million dollar question isn't it and it really hits on the vulnerability of our modern infrastructure it's incredibly reliant on systems that are well sensitive to this kind of thing these high energy particles the geomagnetic currents they create they can have a pretty profound impact. It's like a potential digital domino effect. Domino effect? Yeah. How so? Where does it start? Well, let's think about satellites first. They're right out there, kind of on the front line. The research you sent over highlighted a really stark example from just 2022. Right, I saw that, about the lost satellites. Exactly. Yeah. 38 commercial satellites basically knocked out of commission by solar activity, lost. 38? Wow. Yeah. And that directly impacts things like GPS systems. Think about navigation, not just your car sat-nav, but planes, ships, even precision agriculture. You mean like those automated tractors? Precisely. They rely on GPS for incredible accuracy. A solar storm could throw that off significantly. Imagine the consequences. And then there's satellite communications, global business, remote communities, emergency services. They all depend on that link. It could go offline or become really degraded. So air travel, shipping, military operations too, I imagine. Absolutely. Anything relying on precise navigation or space-based communication is at risk. 
It shows a kind of systemic vulnerability, doesn't it? One event hitting multiple critical areas. Okay, satellites are one thing. What about down here on the ground? Right, good point. The power grids, that's maybe the biggest concern for a widespread disruption. These geomagnetic currents, they don't just stay in space. They can actually induce large electrical currents in long conductors on the ground. Like at power lines. Exactly like power lines. Long transmission lines act like giant antennas. These induced currents can flow into the grid, overload transformers, potentially leading to widespread blackout. And we've seen that happen before, haven't we? We have. The classic example is the Quebec storm in March 1989, caused a massive blackout across the province, left millions in the dark for hours. Wow. In today's world, that would be catastrophic. It would be incredibly disruptive, yeah. Heating, cooling, communication, finance, everything relies on that power. Okay, so satellites, power grids... What else? Communications generally? Yeah, beyond just the satellite comms, even terrestrial communications can be affected. Things like high-frequency radio communication, which some emergency services and aviation rely on, and potentially even disturbances to your mobile phone signal or internet connectivity, depending on the severity and how the infrastructure holds up. It's all interconnected. That really paints a sobering picture of just how fragile some of our essential systems might be. But, okay, this is where things get maybe even more intriguing for a lot of listeners. It's a question that came up a lot in the messages you sent us. Can this solar storm literally make it harder to breathe or affect our health directly? I mean, it sounds a bit out there, maybe. Yeah, it does sound a bit sci-fi at first blush, I agree. And let's be super clear right up front. A CME, a solar storm, it will not directly reduce the amount of oxygen in the air you breathe at ground level. It's not going to suddenly make the air thinner down here. Okay, that's important to state clearly. No sudden lack of oxygen. Definitely not. However, and this is where the research gets interesting, there are indirect effects, secondary effects, and these can potentially impact health, especially for people who are already vulnerable in some way. Indirect effects, like, like what? Okay, so one example really intense geomagnetic activity can actually heat up and cause the Earth's thermosphere to expand. The thermosphere, that's way, way up, right, where the space station orbits. Exactly. Hundreds of kilometers up. So it heats up, it puffs out, what? essentially. The whole upper atmosphere expands. Yeah, it's quite a dramatic effect up there. Now, while that's happening far above us, it can cause subtle changes in atmospheric density even at slightly lower levels. Again, not affecting the oxygen content we breathe directly, but it can have knock-on effects on how the atmosphere circulates globally, and importantly, on air quality. Ah, uh, okay. Air quality. How does the storm affect that? Well, some studies we looked at, including ones archived on PMC, that's the PubMed Central Database, they indicate that increased geomagnetic activity can correlate with reduced lung function in some people. And it seems to amplify the negative effects of existing air pollution, particularly particulate matter. So if the air quality is already bad, the storm could make its impact worse. That seems to be the link researchers are exploring, yes. It looks like it happens through a few complex pathways. It might affect the sympathetic nervous system, that's our body's stress response, the fight or flight system. It might also reduce antioxidant activity in the body, making us less able to cope with pollutants. And it could even change the way tiny pollution particles, aerosols, form and behave in the atmosphere itself. It's like it changes the chemistry of the pollution. That's fascinating. So it's not the storm itself, but how it interacts with our environment and our bodies. Precisely. And other research, like studies by Birch back in 99, and more recently by Zilli, Vieira, and Kutrakis in 2021, they've found links between geomagnetic activity and changes in melatonin excretion. Melatonin, the sleep hormone. That's the one. So potential impacts on sleep cycles, maybe overall well-being. And crucially, these studies also showed a correlation with an increase in ultrafine particles in the air. Ultrafine. Smaller than regular pollution particles. Mm -hmm. Much smaller. And these are known to be particularly bad for respiratory conditions. They can get deeper into the lungs. So if you already have something like asthma or COPD, an increase in these ultrafine particles potentially linked to the storm could definitely make things worse. More difficulty breathing, more flare-ups. It's that connection makes more sense now. Yeah. It's subtle, but potentially significant for certain groups. Exactly. And there was even one study, Fagan et al., in 2014, that suggested a possible link between geomagnetic storms and an increased risk of stroke. Strokes. How? The mechanism isn't fully understood, but if a stroke were to affect the parts of the brain that control breathing, 
Well, that's another indirect, though severe, potential impact on respiratory function. So the key takeaway here for you, the listener, is this. No, the storm won't suffocate you directly, but its cascading effects on air quality, potentially on your body's stress response, maybe even ultrafine particle levels, they can exacerbate existing respiratory problems, especially if you have conditions like asthma or COPD, or maybe live in an area with already high pollution levels. So monitoring air quality reports during such an event and talking to your doctor if you have concerns would be important. Absolutely vital. It's about understanding these indirect but very real potential health connections. Okay, that's a lot to absorb. We've gone from satellites potentially failing to power grids going down to these quite subtle but real health implications. It really makes you think about the bigger picture. What are the wider consequences beyond our gadgets and our personal health right now? How far do these cosmic ripples actually reach into society and the natural world? Yeah, the impacts really do broaden out quite significantly when you start connecting the dots. Think economically, for starters. We touched on power outages. Imagine the sheer financial losses from widespread, prolonged blackouts. Lost productivity, manufacturing halts, spoiled goods. It adds up incredibly fast. And the disruption to finance, communications. Exactly. If real-time financial transactions are delayed or messed up, that could cause chaos in markets. Global supply chains rely on constant communication and power. Major disruptions there have huge economic consequences. And don't forget the cost of fixing things, repairing or replacing damaged transformers on the grid or launching new satellites. Well, we saw those 38 satellites loss. That's enormously expensive and takes time. Insurance costs could skyrocket. A huge economic hit, potentially. What about the environment itself or wildlife? Well, the auroras are beautiful, as we said. A definite environmental effect. True. A positive one, mostly. Mostly, yeah. But the underlying cause that increased radiation does pose risks, especially for satellites and maybe high-altitude flights, as we discussed. More subtly, though, there's evidence that changes in Earth's magnetic field during these storms can affect animal migration. Really? How? Many species, particularly birds, but also fish, sea turtles, even some insects, seem to use the Earth's magnetic field for navigation, like an internal compass. Ah, I've heard about that. So a major disturbance to that field could potentially disorient them, throw off their migration routes, maybe affect breeding patterns. It's an area of ongoing research, but the potential is there for disrupting natural cycles. Fascinating. And what about us, society? Sort of psychological impact. That's a really important point, too. The sheer uncertainty around a major space weather event and the potential for disruption can cause significant public anxiety. If communication systems go down or power is out, getting reliable information becomes difficult, which can feed into fear or even panic if it's not handled well by authorities. Clear communication is key, then. Absolutely crucial. And think about the strain on critical public services, hospitals running on backup generators, emergency responders with disrupted communications, maybe transportation issues hindering access. All of this puts immense pressure on the social fabric, especially during a prolonged event. It tests our collective resilience. Okay, this is starting to sound quite, well, alarming, thinking about all these potential knock-on effects. But surely it's not all just waiting for disaster, right? The sources you shared did mention preparations. What's actually being done? What are countries, organizations doing to get ready for this kind of thing? Yes, absolutely. It's definitely not all doom and gloom, and it's crucial to focus on the proactive steps being taken. There's a lot of work going on. Organizations like NOAA here in the U.S. and ESA, the European Space Agency, they have dedicated space weather prediction centers. So they're watching the sun constantly. Pretty much, yeah. Using satellites and ground-based instruments, they monitor solar activity and issue forecasts and warnings, often giving us hours or even days of notice before a CME arrives. And what does that early warning allow us to do? It's incredibly valuable. For power grid operators, for example, that heads up allows them to take protective measures. They might say, adjust the load on the system, temporarily take sensitive equipment offline, or ensure backup systems are ready. It helps shield the grid from the worst impacts of those induced currents. So they can sort of brace for impact. In a way, yes. Reduce the vulnerability temporarily. Similarly, Airlines get warnings about radiation levels. They can then reroute flights, especially those that would normally fly over polar regions where the radiation exposure is highest during a storm. That protects passengers and crew. Okay, so there are systemic preparations happening. What about for us, for the listeners? Is there anything individuals can do? Definitely. 
Individual preparedness can make a real difference in how comfortable and safe you are during any potential disruption. Think of it like preparing for a hurricane or a major winter storm, really. Basic stuff. Having backup power is great, if possible. Even just simple things like portable power banks to keep your phone charged. A battery-powered or hand-crank radio is fantastic for getting information if the internet or cell service is down. Good old-fashioned radio. Still incredibly useful. And knowing alternative ways to communicate. Maybe have a plan with your family. If phones are out, where do you meet? Who do you check in with? And the basics. Having some extra non-perishable food, bottled water, any essential medications you rely on, enough for maybe 72 hours is usually the recommendation. So it's about basic resilience, really. Exactly. It's not about being scared. It's about being prepared. Understanding the potential risks, however small they might seem for any single event, and taking simple steps can make a huge difference in reducing stress and managing if disruptions do occur. That's really practical advice. It brings it back down to what we can actually control. Wow, what an incredible journey we've taken today, really. We've gone from the sun's uh, fiery surface, literally millions of miles away, all the way down to the technology in your pocket, the power lines outside your window, and even the subtle ways these events might interact with the air you breathe and your own health. It shows how a single, albeit massive, event like a coronal mass ejection can ripple through pretty much everything. Our infrastructure, our health, even the natural world. This deep dive, I think, it really underscores how deeply intertwined our modern lives are with the cosmic environment. Space isn't just out there. It affects us right here. And it leaves us, I think, with a really compelling thought to ponder. As the sun continues through its natural cycles, maybe even becoming more active in the coming years, how might our ever-increasing reliance on sophisticated technology intersect with these powerful celestial events in ways we haven't even fully grasped yet? What kind of long-term, maybe unforeseen effects could emerge from these powerful forces? And what do we as a society need to start thinking about now to be ready for that future? Something to keep exploring, keep questioning, stay informed. Thanks for joining us on The Deep Dive. 